Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. It actually is Friday on the Three Martini Lunch. Your stool awaits. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for you today to close out the work week. And Jim, first of all, it's really warm here in Northern Virginia. Uh, I don't know what we've ever concluded about warm temperatures killing coronavirus, but if it's true... Everybody get outside today. Uh, it's going to be a, a good way to uh, hopefully tamp things down a little bit. Not sure the science of that, but it certainly can't hurt to get a little sun. Uh, but our good martini today is not the weather. It's actually some moderate Democrats prepared, I guess, to stand up to Nancy Pelosi on this $3 trillion coronavirus relief package. Now, take it with a grain of salt. That's an election year. And with Nancy Pelosi... If we remember Obamacare correctly, Jim, we know that she'll uh, let as many votes go as she can without actually not winning the vote. So so she's going to get what she wants, and she's going to let some centrists get what uh, they want here in terms of having an argument that they're not Nancy Pelosi uh, acolytes here. But uh, anyway, it says uh, Nancy Pelosi is projecting confidence that the House will pass Democrats' massive coronavirus relief bill Friday, even as she and her leadership team are still working to secure the votes. Both liberals and centrists in the caucus are grumbling about the roughly $3 trillion measure. House Republicans have overwhelmingly said they oppose the bill, and some Democrats are unable to travel to the Capitol to vote amid the pandemic, leaving Pelosi and her whip operation with tight margins to clear the bill. Uh, Kendra Horn is a moderate from Oklahoma. If you're a Democrat in Congress and you represent Oklahoma, that's about the only uh, way you're going to get there. Uh, She is not going to vote for this thing. She says messaging bills without bipartisan support are a disservice to the American people, especially during a time of crisis. This is not the time for partisan gamesmanship. This is the time to find common ground and deliver help where it is needed most. Uh, I know Allison Spanberger from Virginia, which is a Normally, Republican-leaning district, it's where Eric Cantor and Dave Bratt represented until Spanberger beat Bratt in 2018. She looks like she's edging away from this, and I expect a few other moderates to as well. So, uh, Jim, uh, it's nice to see people standing up to Nancy Pelosi, particularly if it'll actually matter. But uh, is this just Election Day calculation, or is this principle? Oh, it's not principle. We can, we can drive the stake into that one pretty quick and easy. Uh, so the first thing that comes to mind is... Um, if, if they don't have the votes, this is not going to come to the floor. That's, that's, real, <laughs> that's the first rule of being House uh, Speaker of the House is that you know, if, if for some reason there's enough moderate Democrats or Democrats from purple districts who uh, are looking at this and saying, look, this is just not going to fly in my district. This looks very political. This looks like we're trying to, uh, we've created this ridiculous progressive wish list that is completely unrelated to the people's needs at this time. Uh, I can't vote for it. If that, those numbers are high enough, then this will just suddenly die a mysterious death before it can get to the uh, floor. Um, by the way, you think they'd actually have worked. It, you know, it's not like this virus showed up yesterday. You'd think the House would have figured out how to conduct these votes uh, in a safe manner. The fact that they're still working this out is a little bit unnerving and does make you think that maybe Nancy Pelosi should be focused on matters like that instead of putting together this ludicrous uh, wish list. I, you know, there are a lot of good examples of this, uh, you know, of, of things that just are kind of ridiculous that don't, or don't seem to be any particular uh, connection to this virus or the pandemic or any you know, particular economic uh, ramification of it. Rules, you know, on, on costs of lobbying. I think probably the one that jumps out is the, uh, the, uh, the SALT, state and local tax deduction, uh, which was a big fight back in the Republican tax uh, tax cut and blue state Democrats have been pushing against this for a long time. Republicans have been saying, look, you're asking, you, this is basically a subsidy to blue states that have very high state and local taxes. Um, why should the rest of the country pay for your guys' decision to have high taxes uh, in New York State, in New Jersey, in Illinois, and in California? Now, we can have that argument. At the time, I was more skeptical of it, wouldn't mind boosting it a little bit higher. But by and large, most people think that this is, uh, you know, this breaks down very familiar partisan lines. I don't think you can say that of all the people, all all the problems people are facing right now, it's a state and local tax deduction limit. (laughs) I think people have bigger worries. I think people have bigger problems right now. This is what this is, is Democratic lawmakers who say, hey, I've always liked this idea. We have a big bill. Let's shove this in there and hope nobody particularly notices. And there's just too many bad things in it for this to work. And I think, you know, the, the Joe Cunningham's of the world are observing, if you're going to do something like this, 
at least get some Republican buy-in. If this is all just a giant um, gesture to sign, you know, some other, you know, we're trying to generate good headlines and we know it's never going to become law. Hey, we're not out of this crisis yet, all right? This is time to be kind of serious about this stuff. This is not about taking symbolic votes or things that generate particularly good headlines or something like that. There are still massive problems that need to be solved, particularly on the economic front. And the more time you spend on this ludicrous wish list of a bill is the less time you're spending on a bill that might actually get passed. It is a refusal to acknowledge reality of, you know, look, Mitch McConnell is, controls the Senate. The Repo- there's a Republican majority of the Senate. And there's a Republican president. Now, the irony is Trump's open to another big spending bill. The White House is open to, you know, one more of those. I think if you structured it right and you actually could genuinely prove that these ideas would help the people who need it most right now, I think McConnell would be on board with it. But when you do this, because you clearly want to get a, you know, Republicans refuse to consider House bill to help others, you know, we've, we've been through this a million times and just, it feels like this is time to get our game faces on and get some serious problem solving instead of our usual games that we're used to seeing in Washington. I have to think we are going to see another big bill here because the one that passed at the end of March, beginning of April, whenever that was, uh, I guess a month and a half ago now, that was designed to last about two or three months. And the way things are being opened up now, at least in, in some places, it's obviously very, very slow. And I have to think there's going to be more stimulus down the road. Do you think that's a given at this point or yet to be seen? I think it's likely. Uh, I think it's, you know, unsurprisingly, uh, you know, there's more enthusiasm amongst Democrats than there are for Republicans. Republicans, you're starting to hear a little bit of murmuring from the likes of, of Pat Toomey that, hey, if we're going to do this, you know, at some point we do need to worry about the deficit. We are, you know, well past the one trillion. We're, you know, some estimates a three trillion deficit in a year, which is, you know, I, I can remember when one trillion was considered unthinkable, Greg, way back in that. Yep. Those golden days of 2009, 2010. But having said that, you know, Powell certainly indicated, the Fed, uh, Fed chairman Powell said that he's not really worried about the deficit right now. He thinks that the immediate impact on struggling Americans is greater. You know, that's, that's going to carry some weight on Capitol Hill. So there's going to be some need to do something. Um, but I think people are going to want this a lot more targeted towards the people who need it most um, rather than uh, uh, the kind of, you know, hey, we've always wanted this. It's Christmas. Everybody gets what they want. So. Yes, not letting the crisis go to waste. Yeah, that's both Jerome Powell at the Fed and Al Powell who agree that uh, <laughs> Powell's always good and, you know, Gruber's always bad. All right, let's move on to our bad martini now, Jim. And uh, we have obviously seen some major developments in the Russia realm in the past couple of weeks. Uh, First of all, there was the decision of the Justice Department to drop the case against former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn, citing a lot of uh, shady FBI motivation and tactics with that interview they did just after Trump was inaugurated back in 2017. Uh, The interview that Attorney General Bill Barr granted right after that was to Catherine Herridge of CBS. Many of our listeners will remember Catherine for many years at the Fox News Channel where she was their chief national security or uh, investigative intelligence, that that whole section of the government. She was their lead reporter on those things. And then CBS, I believe, broke the story on the unmasking of who wanted to get information on Michael Flynn. And that's how we know that uh, Joe Biden and uh, many other figures who have been involved with this uh, investigation uh, were among those who were asking to unmask Michael Flynn. And well, as a result of the fact that Catherine Harris has been at the forefront of both of these two stories, the knives are now out, starting with uh, Andrew Bates of the Biden campaign. He's now deleted this tweet, but right after the the unmasking documents came out, he said, scoop, Catherine Herridge is a partisan right-wing hack who is a regular conduit for conservative media manipulation ploys because she agrees to publicize things before contacting the target for comment. Now today, Daily Beast, here's their tweet. Democrats on Capitol Hill have grown particularly irked by Catherine Herridge's work believing she's become a de facto clearinghouse for conservative conspiracy theorists who want to give their material the veneer of mainstream objectivity. Uh, Jim, I've had a few uh, brief interactions with Catherine Herridge. First of all, she's an absolutely delightful person, very kind. Uh, And also, if you watch her work, I've seen more of it on Fox, obviously, than CBS, but uh, she's known for waving documents at you. She's not just there to uh, repeat press releases from conservative members of Congress and so forth. So she actually has details behind what she reports. She's one of the best in the business, if not the best. And uh, kudos to CBS News on this because they've defended her now. Their statement in response to this is, Catherine is a deeply sourced reporter 
who has worked the national security beat for two decades and just last week secured one of the biggest newsmaker interviews with Attorney General William Barr, which was cited by national and international outlets. This is the kind of aggressive reporting we applaud at CBS News. So, Jim, uh, in, in our email before this uh, recording today, I said this kind of smacks of one person's willing to do a story. And so then everyone who doesn't want to do the story declares that person, uh, you know, bought and paid for by the other side. Uh, is that too cynical or uh, what are we watching here? Well, I, I think what's also important noting is that there's a release, two separate releases, but they basically say the same thing, Greg, from uh, both the Biden campaign and Democrats on Capitol Hill saying, can you believe Catherine Herridge tried to sit at our lunch table? <laughs> I mean, as if. Um, so there's, there's a really deeply frustrating narrative that's, that's floated around really for decades. It's that, you know, conservatives are not represented in the mainstream media uh, because they don't do reporting. Uh, because they don't have the skills, they don't have the abilities, um, they just aren't as inherently intellectual and curious and all these other wonderful traits that progressives believe that they themselves and only them have. Um, I've tried to push back against this quite a bit. I you know, think of myself as somebody who wears the hats of both commentator and reporter. There are days I'm going to go out and try to f- answer questions and give you information. And there are days I'm going to say, hey, here's, here's what I think about it. And y'all are just going to have to sort that out. Uh, but, you know, that there, there's been, in addition to National Review, in addition to uh, fine radio reporters all across America, the Daily Signal operation over there, the Weekly Standard did plenty of reporting. Um, Eliana Johnson, who is, you know, formerly from Politico and who's now over at the Washington Free Beacon. The Washington Free Beacon generates scoops all the time, uh, in part because they're looking where no one else is. Uh, going back to the American Spectator days, I mean, there's always been right of center organizations that have gone out and tried to uncover new information, find scoops and do so. And the general, you know, and most people prefer not to see that. Now, Catherine Herridge was at Fox News for a long time. But look, she's not Sean Hannity. (laughs) She's not Bill O'Reilly. She was the defense and Pentagon correspondent. So generally what she was reporting about First of all, it generally was more, uh, less likely to end up in the typical partisan fray, but also just, you know, she was, she was really good at her job. She, you know, um, she knew what she was talking about. Her sources were good. Her stories checked out. And it is so, people start wondering, you know, oh, why, you know, um, you know, if conservative reporters were so good, they'd be in these mainstream institutions. Well, look at the response to Cheryl Atkinson at CBS News. Uh, look at the way the Atlantic and the way the Atlantic staff responded when uh, Kevin Williamson was brought on. There was this, you, you don't see, I, I keep trying, you know, look at the response to Brett Stevens over at the New York Times. There's just this anger that, that somebody from a right of center perspective could come along and give some sort of assessment or reporting or information that doesn't fit with the preconceived notions of either the other staffers there uh, or the other audience there. Let's point out, Brett Stevens is not, you know, (laughs) frothing at the mouth, uh, you know, right wing, you know, uh, know, nobody's going to mistake him for Rush Limbaugh. Catherine Herridge is not a, you know, frothing at the mouth, um, you know, pounding the table, uh, uh, you know, verbal bomb thrower. But because she has done the, the, you know, committed the crime, and I'm making air quotes as I say that, of reporting something that Democrats don't want to hear, the, the message has gone out, she must be destroyed. And it is not the least bit surprising, the publications that are jumping on board and are eager to lead the charge. Um, it, is, it is high school. It is mean girls. It is uh, uh, entirely unbecoming and unworthy of the reputations these institutions think they have that I think they lost a long time ago. Uh, and it's deeply frustrating to say this is how, even with everything else that's going on, it has not increased the seriousness or the clear thinking of the general media environment one iota. And now it's the same instinct of anybody who reports something like this must be bad. And the Catherine, it's Catherine Herridge's turn to have a bullseye on her back, so to speak. Yes, absolutely uh, unfair and and despicable. But I guess the silver lining here is that if you actually do uh, pursue stories, even if nobody else wants to, uh, you'll get noticed for that because you're the only one who has the story. And uh, the fact that uh, all this venom is aimed at her, uh, I think it was Dan Quayle who said way back when, I wear their scorn as a badge of honor. I don't know how Catherine Herridge is reacting to this in her own mind, but uh, that's kind of how I look at it. All right, on to our crazy martini now, Jim. And this has been a recurring crazy martini, which is a bit unsettling as we head into uh, 
the general election campaign season here quite soon. Of course, Joe Biden is going to be the Democratic nominee. The Veep stakes, which woman is he going to pick, are, are wide open. He was on with Stacey Abrams on Lawrence O'Donnell's show on MSNBC the other night, and Larry teed him up perfectly to say whether uh, she was going to be the running mate, and Joe absolutely <laughs> went in a completely other direction. So uh, sorry, Stacey Abrams, but we scooped that about a week or two ago that you're probably not going to be the choice. But then on another, uh, I don't know if he was being interviewed or was just a statement uh, from his lair there in Delaware, uh, Joe Biden was talking about uh, the toll of the pandemic here in the United States, both in terms of lives and jobs. And it came out like this. This is not a moment for excuses or deflections or blame game. We're 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 it's we're in the middle of a pandemic that had cost us more than eighty five thousand jobs as of today, lives of millions of people, millions of people, millions of jobs. You know, and we're in a position where you know we just got new unemployment insurance this morning uh, numbers. So. Jim, he says, uh, you know, he had the jobs and the thousands and he had the, the deaths and the millions. And, and, and basically, you, you kind of get the idea of where he was going with this. But I, I just feel like if he wins, we're going to have four years of, well, you know what he meant, right? Yeah, which we very often hear from Trump fans. <laughs> 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 you know, I, my, uh, I was chatting with uh, my colleague, Charlie Cook, earlier today. And he said, you know, look. Everybody makes gaffes. Everybody has moments where the words don't come out of their mouth the way they expected them to. I, I chuckled when, you know, Barack Obama as a candidate back in 2008 says, we've been traveling around a lot lately and I think we've hit uh, 57 states now, you know. Um, and people are, you know, people choke that like, how many states are in the United States is the kind of question they ask you when you've had a concussion. And uh, <laughs> they want to make sure that you're, you're still thinking clearly. But we all know what was going on there. You know, Barack Obama was thinking 47. He'd think he'd been to almost all 50 states, and it said 57 instead of 47. Okay, it happens. It's not that Barack Obama, for all his flaws, and the man has many. <laughs> it's not, his problem is not that he doesn't know how many states are in the union. We can all have a chuckle about this, but this is not something you should really use to assess uh, the, the quality of Barack Obama as president or as a candidate or something like that. With, with Joe Biden, it's a little bit tougher because these happen with surprising frequently. And, you know, we, we're, we're used to things, you know, stand up, Chuck, when the gentleman was in a wheelchair, um, you know, this is a big blanking deal. Like we're kind of used to, you know, in some ways, Joe Biden is almost like the Yogi Berra of the political world. You know, he's, he's always saying these things that don't make any sense, but they kind of make sense if you think about them. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. Uh, <laughs> that place is so crowded. Nobody goes there anymore. You know, um, and you could kind of chuckle with it. But again, we're talking about a man who's now well into his 70s and who, you know, these are not hostile cross-examination style questions he's generally getting. And we're getting word salad. And it generally, you know, okay, so he was mixing up the number of deaths and the number of unemployed. And it sounds really weird when he says we've got 85,000 people out of work and we've got uh, millions and millions dead. You know, okay, all right. We, we, we kind of know what he was going at. He just kind of mixed them together. Okay, fine. But this happens, if not every sentence, then probably almost every answer in one form or another. And as I've said, I, people say, ah, you know, Jim, you're making fun of a man for his stutter. No, no, we, we've all seen stutters. We, we know what stutters are. We've all been listening to Joe Biden speak for, for decades. At his best, Joe Biden can give a really good speech. Uh, he's always been the backslapper. There's always been kind of this, you know, up ah, crazy Uncle Joe, uh, you know, uh, attitude around him or something. This isn't the same guy. This is a guy who... In almost every answer, you can almost see it in his eyes. He's got a point he wants to make, and he starts, but he gets halfway there, and all of a sudden he thinks of something else. So the sentence stops. He shifts over. He starts this other sentence. But then he realizes he didn't forget the first one, so he goes back to that. He didn't finish the first one, so he goes back to that. Then all of a sudden, there's this third point that comes in, and it's, you know, it all just kind of comes out as word salad. And you know, God bless the English teacher who tries to diagram these sentences. Or for that matter, probably the sentences I say, speaking off the cuff on this podcast. But anyway, the point being that, that this is not the Joe Biden who's quite who he used to be. And it's not him as his, as his, as his best communicator. Um, is the man he's running against, you know, Cicero? No. <laughs> this is going to be, we, we've all, you know, from the very beginning, people are saying, oh, my God, Trump versus Biden. Can you imagine the debates? It's going to be, you know, grumpy old men, just, you know, Matthau and uh, Lemon yelling at each other. But it's, this is, you know. As we head into what's probably going to be a very challenging period for our country that is not going to end by January 20th, 2021, 
we're still going to be dealing with the economic after effects. We may have a vaccine by then if everything goes super duper terrific. I don't think we can count on that. It's probably not. We're still going to be dealing with, you know, the, the ramifications of this, the world ramifications of this, our relationship with China. This is not, you know, this virus is not going to make the world more stable around, you know, places like Africa, South America, the Middle East. Um, we're going to have our hands full. If, you know, by, by every stretch of the imagination, people are going to be angry. People are going to be depressed. People are going to be um, just full of frustration. If, if you're trying to recruit for an extremist cause, this is a really fertile territory right now. We need the best, you know, leadership we can possibly get. And we're heading into an election in November between President Trump and Joe Biden, Greg. <laughs> Feel the excitement. Or I guess, um, what's his name? Congressman, Libertarian. Amash? Yes, that's his name. <laughs> <laughs> well, that whirling was... dervish of raw political charisma who's unforgettable. <laughs> yeah, you know he's got big momentum when somebody follows politics as closely as we do. It's like, you know, what's, his, that what's guy. his name again? Yeah. Oh, yeah, him. Yeah. I mean, the Greens will find somebody. Um, Jesse Ventura, you know, the, uh, the guy who sued a war hero's widow for defamation. So right, to, to give you a sense of where things are, Greg, last night on, on social media, I came across a video and it's like, wow, that looks really good. And it's Vermin Supreme, the guy who has a boot <laughs> on his head. And I'm not saying I'm voting for him. <laughs> I'm just saying, hmm, that's a good ad. I like that message. <laughs> The question is, does wearing a boot on your head help protect you from the virus? I don't think it does. I don't know. I would think that would be kind of a breeding ground, depending on how often you actually wear the boot. If it's only on your head, I would think it's fairly dry in there. But uh, I don't really particularly want to be the one conducting the experiment. Ah. On that note, Jim. Is it true that it's Friday? It is true. So enjoy it. It's going to be a lovely weekend, at least in this area, hopefully in your part of the country as well. And uh, have a great weekend. Jim, see you Monday. See you Monday, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks so much for being with us today. Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast. Leave us a kind review. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll keep your stool ready for you for the Monday edition of the Three Martini Lunch.